remember that one of the memorable decisions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I, I thought since you guys are very well read in the scriptures, you probably read Colossians many times through, you know, the basic message there. So I thought I would just cover maybe some uh, just related things. Some of the things I came across in doing my own research and preparing for a message on Colossi. And one of them, uh, I saw, which is a continual problem for all of us when we want to study the Bible, and, and that is how many man-made additions there are, you know, when you just pick up your Bible, I mean, when you get a commentary, you, well, hopefully you know you're getting uh, a good bit of human addition there, but, you know, you think, wow, you just pick up your Bible and, and, and you read it that uh, you can you know, kind of rely on it. You can read the little introduction and, and you know, that, that kind of thing. Well, I, I was just <laughs> kind of bowled over. I'm going to share with you some of the stuff I saw. One of them, I, I call it the Sherlock Holmes syndrome that uh, some of these Bible editors seem to, to have. How many of you watch Sherlock Holmes, any of the, or read the books? <laughs> wow, there's a bunch of hands that didn't go up. Do you know who he is? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I've, I've probably seen every, every single film edition, every TV edition of it, read the, the, the uh, books yeah. and, and all that. Anyway, one of the things that, you know, is always his trademark, you know, a client comes to him and he says, oh, you're from, you know, so-and-so and, -so and you're, right. you, you know, you're a potter and all this. Well, how did you know that? You know, well, I mean, he'd look at Doug and say, yeah, I can tell the dust in your shoes, you must be from Atlanta. And... Uh, <laughs> You uh, sometimes say tomato, mm -hmm. so you must have some relation to Brit, but you don't always say it, so it must be your wife who's British, you know, and that, that, yeah. that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, I mean, it's it's fun in a book, We're but trying it's... affectation. Sorry. Right, so I'm going, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of nonsense in real life, but I mean, these these guys do, it's doing the Bible, it's, it's like, hey, I want to be Sherlock Holmes. I'm, I'm going to read you what I... Uh, since I'm not a Greek scholar like... Doug, I like to read a lot of different translations so I can get, you know, different biases and different, you know, ways to, to uh, read it. And so I read a number of different translations of Colossians, and I read the introduction to each one. Okay, one of them said this. The Colossians had an exaggerated regard for the observance of rites and ceremonies, and they also indulged in some form of worshiping of angels. They were infected, therefore, with a heresy which seems to have had both Jewish and Gnostic elements. Well, and again, I'm assuming you've recently read the book. Right. Yeah, I mean, did Paul say any of that? No, see, because he says don't let anybody, uh, uh, you know, pull you away to the worship of angels and all that. Oh, that means they're infected with angel worship. Mm -hmm. It's like, whoa, whoa. You know, it gave us illustration of there are reasonable inferences that you can make when you re read a passage. Yeah. I mean, it's like when he was talking with his supposed daughter and uh, about uh, uh, take. Am I the only one who fell for that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're the only one that the one doesn't know me as well. <laughs> anyway, um, he has a reasonable inference that he's uh, telling her to, you know, take care of her grandmother while uh, he's here. But it wouldn't be a reasonable inference to say, because he told her to, you know, be patient with her. You know, she normally abuses her grandmother when they're gone. And she just, <laughs> you know, there's a reasonable yeah. inference in the imagination, you know, or he's talking about the good grades she made, you know. Yeah, well, it's normally she just flunks, you know, and so big moves, and she, you know. See, I mean, that's just nonsense. Yeah. Yeah, I've spent most of my adult life earning my living by interpreting documents. I'm, I'm a, an attorney, as most of you know. I was a title attorney. And, and, you know, that's my job, is to read deeds, wills, contracts, things like that. And, you know, in the real world, you would never do the kinds of things that people do with God's Word. Yeah. You know, and it should be reversed. We should have a, a you know, lower standard when we're just dealing with deeds and, and wills, and a much higher standard when we're touching God's Word. But it's the other way around. I mean, you wouldn't take a will and say, ah, oh, he left it to these children. No doubt he has other children from another marriage, and he has disinherited them. And, you know, it's like, what? I mean, <laughs> you 
You wouldn't ever do anything like that. You read exactly what it says and what it doesn't say. You know, again, you can make, yes, reasonable inferences, but you don't start speculating on, on things like that. But, uh, yeah, that's what people do with the Bible. All right, I, I went to another uh, Bible translation, and this is what it said about the Colossians. The Colossian heresy was a local blend of Jewish, perhaps a scene, and Oriental ideas. The heretics thought that they were supplementing apostolic Christianity, which they saw as primitive, with greater knowledge and better access to spiritual things. They imagined that A, the hierarchy of celestial powers, i.e. the angels, was supreme rather than Christ. B, Christ was not unique in his divine nature nor in his actions. For he was not God, but one of several mediators. C. Sin resulted from a lack of knowledge, a particular sort of knowledge in which the heretics were specialists. And D. Salvation consisted in having this gnosis imparted by a series of rituals and ascetic practices, among which Jewish rites were prized, but Christian baptism was considered a mere low level initiation. It's like, <laughs> huh? <laughs> That's what Colossians says? I mean, now, if you want to say, hey, here's one speculation that this was going on, okay, yeah, I mean, it's possible that this was, was what was happening, but, you know, it just presented this, and this is at the beginning. I mean, Martin Luther, the genius that he was, evil genius, but, you know, <laughs> you know, to tell people we have to read the Bible ourselves, but then to put introductions at the front of every chapter, that told the reader what that, uh, not every chapter, every book, what that book was going to tell them. And to define the words that were used there, what Paul meant when he said we're not under the law. Well, he's not talking about the Mosaic law. He's talking about, you know, the Christian acts and, and all this. So, yeah, so you read it, and it's funny. For 1,500 years, people read the Bible. None of them interpreted it the way Luther did, not even Augustine. And then, you know, Luther's Bible comes out, and suddenly, boy, everybody else is black and white, you know. Why? Because, yeah, they're reading his introductions, which tell them what it's going to say, and yeah, then you follow that. If you read this, and you didn't know better, yeah, you'd be saying, yeah, that's right, he, he has to tell them about Christ, because they don't think Christ is really the, you know, divine, and that, that there's other mediators and all that. Anyway, so what do we really know about the church in Colossians? Well, Paul tells us this, I'd like to think that Paul was an honest man, a fairly straightforward man, that's how I find him in the rest of the New Testament. Paul says this, we give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. Then he continues, for this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's what he explains why he's writing them. They're a faithful congregation. He's heard about the, the love that they have for the, the brothers. He wants to encourage them. He wants to uh, give them exhortation. He wants to review the fundamentals of the faith, because obviously, I think we can reasonably surmise, if Paul says don't let anybody uh, pull your way into the worship of angels. Well, somebody must have been teaching about the worship of angels somewhere. I think we can surmise that, that Paul doesn't just invent a heresy and, and in case this somehow comes along, you know, uh, be ready for it. But he doesn't say the church is infected with that. He doesn't indicate that this is a problem congregation. In fact, he, you know, starts off, uh, uh, you know, praising them. And, and yes, it's true that, like even in the seven... Uh, Churches in Revelation, except for uh, Laodicea, that, uh, you know, yeah, Jesus starts off, he wants to find something good. Paul tries to do that, but, you know, like in Corinth, I mean, you know, yes, he commends them in about, you know, one sentence, and then he immediately says, but I have this, that you've got divisions, and, you know, I mean, Paul is a straightforward person. And what, what these uh, editors forget is they didn't have a New Testament. Paul's day in the day of the Colossians. See, we're used to, yeah, we want to know what the Christian faith is. Well, we have the New Testament, we have the Bible, we 
we got Doug Jacoby's books, you know, we got that. That covers it, right? Which in some ways are better. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean it's it's a wow. It's not hard today. They didn't have that. You know, you don't know which of Paul's letters they had. You don't know which of the gospels they may have had or may not have had. Paul wants to just hey, I, I want to firm you up. Obviously, we can tell from his letter to uh, both letters to Timothy, there are heresies floating around or uh, spiritual misunderstandings. One of them, and we see this all in the New Testament. I mean, what is the main issue that Paul has to keep dealing with, church after church, uh, person after person? Not a trick question, but what's what's the, the main issue? It has something to do with Jews? Jew Gentiles. Gentiles. Yeah, and, and the, the Jews, you know, yeah, they're ready to accept Gentiles if the Gentiles will become Jewish converts and be circumcised, keep the law. And so Paul, I mean, Romans... Uh, Ephesians, he talks about it, uh, Colossians, Galatians, it's the main subject, Acts 15. I mean, you know, it's not any secret that this was a church-wide problem. I don't see it as a heresy so much as God had revealed new light, and it was very hard for the Jews to accept that. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I, I could try to put myself in their shoes. I mean, here for 1,500 years, mm -hmm. I mean, this is, God gave them the law. It wasn't something man-made. He said to do this, and now... You're saying that people don't have to do this. We've been doing this all, all of our life. That, that's, that's a hard transition to, uh, to to make. So, yeah, he brings that up in Colossians. I mean, should that surprise us? Does that tell us that the church is infected with this heresy? No, it tells us, I think, more than likely, we can make the inference there were Jews in the congregation at, at Colossae. So, again, Paul is, you know, trying to help his uh, the Gentiles, who he has a special heart for, that, yeah, don't don't... Don't be keeping the Sabbath and all that. I mean, you know, you're, you're saved, explains the importance of baptism. They know that, but just to shore it up, you don't need anything else from the law uh, beyond that. Uh, you know, there, there wasn't anything just really set forth extremely clear about who Jesus was. I mean, you go through, uh, well, John wasn't out yet. So, you know, you go through Matthew and that. It's easy. You, you know, he's the Messiah, that he's the Son of God. I think you can maybe see enough to understand he's divine, but, you know, there's it's not crystal clear. Yeah, Colossians, he, hey, let, let's make sure everyone understands who exactly he is and the, the nature of his divinity. But none of that indicates, I don't see Colossians as a problem church, you know, at mm. all. Now, again, yeah, maybe it was, you know, that, that's a possibility, but nothing in there says that. Do you see the difference between you know, just inventing things? I mean, it's fine if you want to say, now, here's one possibility, and then here's another. Okay, that's fair, but to just, like these guys do, you know, it's just like, now, the, the uh, other, other way that we get, um, well, there's, there's several other ways that even when we're reading the Bible, we're getting human bias and often not even realizing it, and that is the division of chapters and verses. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I've... Wow. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I read the early Christian writings, I've been a Bible student, you know, um, since childhood. I mean, Jehovah's Witness, but they are pretty strong students of the Bible. I mean, it, it, but uh, <coughs> yeah, I didn't know the chapters and verses weren't part of the Bible, that this was something man-made. The chapters didn't come in until uh, the early 1200s. That means throughout most of Christian history, there were no chapters or verses. I mean, you read the whole thing. I mean, they're awfully handy, and, and we're so locked into them now. You know, I'm not suggesting we throw them out, but, you know, they, when you don't have that, then you, you are kind of impelled to read the whole thing, and, you know, a book like Colossians, that's not very long, you can read it, yeah. you know, and, and so you see the whole thing, but boy, with verses, you think you can just, you know, stop right here, each one is a complete thought in itself, and the interesting thing is, um, who was it, Art, it was one of the, um, Stephen Langton, he was Archbishop of Canterbury, Roman Catholic, and, uh, I, I had to smile because there's an uh, just, boy, a major goo. Go to chapter 4 if you have Colossians in front of you. Chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. <coughs> now what, <laughs> that statement, what does it go with? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. everything you right above it, he's yeah. talking about it. husbands, mm-hmm. wives, parents, <laughs> children, slaves, and then suddenly she starts a new chapter to put in one sentence. I mean, that's that's a no-brainer. Where where he should have divided that up. I, I mean, he's fallible. Um, I haven't caught a, a lot of things, but and here there's no doctrinal is, issue in, involved in it. Uh, now maybe in his day, I don't know. Maybe it was purposeful that he uh, didn't want. Well, I don't know if they had slaves, but certainly servants, you know, reading, you know, servants, masters together, you know, <coughs> we'll break up in another chapter and talk about masters. I don't, I don't know. I mean, it, I, it, it's to me inexplicable why he would uh, stick that off in one, one sentence into an, another chapter when it ties to everything that goes ahead of it. But a lot of places, yeah, it can, it can influence you where it's divided. So always remember that, that the, the chapters, those are man-made. The verses didn't come in until the, the middle of the 1500s. Robert Stephanus, who was preparing the Greek text that uh, most of the Protestant Bibles uh, have come from, the King James and, and all of that, he's the one who put in our verses. And again, now he would have been, at that point, he had been Roman Catholic, but he was Reformed, I believe, at that point. And, you know, it's going to affect how you do things. Your theology, when you start giving this up, it's going to affect how you look at things. And, you know, the bad thing about verses, and again, they're, they're awfully handy, and I, I, it'd be hard to, to preach without them. We're so used to it, but obviously they preach without them for, you know, 1,200 years or 1,500 years, most of Christian history without verses. Um, is, well, like people say, John 3.16, you know, everyone knows what that says, as if that is a complete thought Mm-hmm. All in itself. Well, what, what does he say before? What does he say after? You, you know? But you think, because it's there, and I guarantee you, the vast majority of Christians think this is something from God, the, the chapters and verses. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, uh, always remember that. The other thing, I normally read from the New King James Version, but um, the Bible I have is a pretty heavy, hardbound one, and I thought, well, it'd be lighter on the plane to take another translation. I, I think most of you have NIV. I thought, well, New American Standard, um, I had always been told the New American Standard was the most literal. And and so I thought, (laughs) well, this would be a good one uh, to bring. And I was just, you know, reading it uh, on the plane, and then after I was here, I was just shocked by some of the things that they do. Uh, I'm going to read you, go to chapter 4, verse 16. Paul says, and when this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and you, for your part, read the letter from Laodicea. That's what the Greek text says. Is that what is the NIV saying? After this letter has been read, do you see that it's also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea? Okay, <coughs> that's that's you know for this. This is what the new, the New American Standard actually says. I wasn't reading what it actually says. <laughs> And like I said, this is supposed to be, you know, the most literal. It's like, it says, the last part, and you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. And then it has a little uh, 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 footnote uh, indication by my, and then it says, literally, the. Now, why on earth, the, and then you put my? I mean, that's, <laughs> I mean, sometimes, yeah, li- the literal isn't a good translation, but the, and you put my instead. See, the thing is, we don't know what that letter is. The early Christians didn't know, but they had two speculations, and probably the most two reasonable inferences. One, it was a letter that the Laodiceans wrote to Paul, and Paul wanted Colossae to read it too. Maybe the Laodiceans talked about, hey, we've got some problem teachers who come here and, and, and all of that. It says, read the letter from Laodicea. So that was, uh, and I know all of our commentaries say, well, it's probably Ephesians. Okay. That's another possibility that um, it's what we know as Ephesians. And a third one, it's a letter that got lost and we don't, we don't have. But yeah, to read this, it sounds like it's definitely a letter that Paul wrote and that is you know, being passed on. And it's like, I mean, I, I can't imagine doing that with a human document. You know, I've got somebody's deed and I just, well, surely they meant this. And so I just, like, <laughs> I mean, it's like, I can't believe we, God's word that we, we just, Treat it like we wouldn't a human document, you know? I mean, to me, it, it's just shameful that anybody would, would do that. And then, like I say, this is supposed to be the, the most literal. 
One other quick thing, I'm not the Greek person, and, and Doug uh, uh, can correct me if I'm if I uh, he feels I'm, I'm wrong in this. Is always watching out for idioms because does everyone know what an idiom is? It's it's a phrase that you really can't translate literally into another language because it's it's not meant literally. Hold your horses, you know. We all know what that means, but you know somebody and you know Tonga or, or, or wherever you, you know. I mean. Nigeria, would that mean anything to people? Hold your horses? Yeah, it's like, what, what, what are you talking about? What's a horse? Hold your horses. Where is America? Slow down. Slow down. Does that help? I, I think there's one here in um, Colossians, and, and uh, Doug, if you think differently. Um, uh, <laughs> When Paul is, is uh, uh, telling them about the gospel, he, he says this, he calls it the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven. You're all familiar with that? Well, you know, I've talked to Christians who think, well, now it says every creature under heaven. So that means somehow it got preached to the people out in the Pacific Islands, to the American <laughs> Indians, uh, deep Africa, India, Far East, it says every creature <laughs> under heaven, you know? Well, and the horses. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't say every human, every creature, you right. know? Well, yeah, how about Likens that? Too. <laughs> yeah, how about that? That's an idiom, it's meaning it's, it's been preached everywhere, you know? For those Gosh. of you who speak Spanish, how do you say everyone in, in Spanish? Todo hey, todo everyone has heard todo it. Todo, todo, todo el mundo, literally, the, the whole, whole world. world. And you don't mean the whole world, you just, you know, and, you, and when we say everyone, no, we don't mean every single person on the planet. These are ways of, of, of saying things. So always remember that if something just seems to go against all logic, everything else the scriptures teach, yeah, maybe it's an idiom rather than getting hung up on it. So you wouldn't preach that they reached the entire known Roman Empire world in their time and their generation? I don't think so. Well, I mean, that's, that would not be a horribly unreasonable thing. Yeah, that it, they preached throughout the whole known world. I, yeah, this was 100, but boy, this was probably written in 59, 58. I, I kind of doubt it, but yeah, I, I wouldn't rule that out as a possibility. Yeah, that, that's, uh, uh, but again, it still would be an, 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 an idiom. He's not talking about the, every creature under heaven. Okay, one last thing. These are just some, uh, like I say, points that, uh, you might not normally come across uh, since you are the deeper thinking ones here on the, the, the turf. Um, okay. <laughs> you give us a lot of credit there. What is something? If by steep you mean. Is that a reasonable inference? <laughs> yeah, that is it. I thought it sounds like an idiot to me. Was that talking about Joey, that may be true. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, Colossians 2, verses 14 uh, and 15. Verses that, yeah, most of my life I never really thought that much uh, about any unique meaning to them. I'll just pick up at verse 14. Having canceled out, this is the new NAS, the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us and which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Now, um, one of the... Uh, People, I, I often will look at how did he understand a passage is John Chrysostom, or sometimes pronounced Chrysostom, um, only because, I mean, he was like 370, somewhere in there, but um, because he was the Bishop of Constantinople, uh, you had people taking down his sermons in shorthand, and, and they preached exegetically, you know, verse by, by verse. So his sermons make, you know, kind of a nice commentary. Uh, giving a flavor, how did they understand things, you know, back in that day. Now, it's still a few hundred years after Christ, so, yeah, because he says something doesn't make it so, but 
Yeah, he's understanding those verses as talking about the atonement. And the early Christians understood the atonement very differently than uh, what most Christians today do. And I, I thought maybe I'd share that with you. It makes absolutely no difference to me, your understanding of the atonement. I, 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 that has nothing to do, in my, in my view, with salvation. But um, for a lot of people, I, I found the early Christian view makes a lot of sense, and the view that was preached by the Reformers, which is all most people have ever heard, uh, it, it kind of turned them against God. And so they found this very encouraging. So I'm going to share with you how the early Christians uh, understood the atonement and you know, tied it into to that passage there. If you don't like it, yeah, hey, when you leave this room, just leave it back here in the room. It's, you know, it's it really, it's one of those things we don't know. The Bible doesn't just set it out in, in perfect uh, order, in which case I have to maybe make the reasonable assumption that it's not that important to God that we understand it. It's important we believe that Jesus died for us and that we get eternal life through his shed blood. But how that all works, no, I don't think God thinks it's important or else he would have laid it out for us. But their view is, is sometimes called the ransom theory of the, of the atonement, uh, sometimes the Christus Victor theory. Uh, any of those terms, Christus Victor, a few of you have, have, have heard that. And don't feel bad if you didn't. I, when I read the early church, uh, I remember for a couple years I went around telling everyone, you know, it's interesting, as dynamic as the early Christians were, and they died for Christ without hesitation, that none of them understood the atonement. I mean, I'd never heard another view of the atonement, and it looked like they were just really mixed up on it, you know, and I told lots of people that, until one day, a uh, friend of mine who was, have you ever heard of the moral government uh, school of theology, Charles Finney? Uh, anyway, and I don't know if he held this view of the atonement, but anyway, it was people in that school of, of theology, a, a, a pastor friend of mine, he said, uh, they, what, they, what they believed was the Christus Victor uh, understanding of the atonement. Oh, what's that? I've got a book here, you know, and he let me read the book. I read the book. Oh, so this is what they're saying, you know, that, uh, wow. What most people don't realize is what Christians believed about the atonement for, let me see if I've got the date here, I think 1,200 years, uh, the 11th century. So half of Christian history, they never heard of our view of the atonement. Uh, you know, if you explain the atonement and how it's explained today that God, well, and I don't know what you as ICOC have, have, have heard, but what most people hear, uh, that even I heard as a Jehovah's Witness, you know, God declared we would die, uh, couldn't just forgive us, then it would mean that uh, he wasn't upholding his own law. So somebody had to get punished, you know, and if it wasn't us, then God had to punish Jesus instead of us. So he took our place and God punished him, and then that way we're okay because God couldn't just forgive us. Now, the odd thing about that is Jesus commands us to forgive one another <laughs> just as you are forgiven. Yes. But then, then we're told, but no, God couldn't forgive us, and so he punished, you know, some innocent person instead of us. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm saying that in kind of a mocking thing, and I really shouldn't, because it's, you know, it is what most people believe. Now, that actually didn't come in until the Reformers, so that's only been maybe 500 years that people have, have held to, um, to that view. The early Christians, uh, well, we'll make it real easy. How many of you have read The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, or seen the movie? Everybody here, okay. That is... Turkish Delight. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the Forbidden Fruit, Turkish Delight. Yeah, I think that was on purpose. Man yes. got into trouble through food, and the same thing happens in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. But now, how does the ransom work in The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe? I hate to say that. Yeah, and who's doing the punishing? The witch. The evil one. The evil one. That's right. Queen. That uh, Edmund sold himself. He was the lawful prey of the white witch. And Aslan, out of his love, says, I'll tell you what, if you'll let Edmund go free, you can kill me instead. Mm -hmm. And that was the only way uh, the white witch would let Edmund free. Would, yeah, you die instead. 
that this is C.S. Lewis understood the early Christian view of the atonement, and as he presented, that's how they understood that Adam and Eve, by choosing to listen to Satan and follow him instead of God, that they sold themselves and their offspring into bondage. Now that sounds strange to 21st century, and see, one of the problems we all have is we want to read our modern way of thinking, whether modern is 1500, uh, 2013, you know, whatever. We want to make the people in the New Testament that they think like us. But see, we need to get our mind into how did they think back then. It was a normal thing in their day for parents to sell their children into slavery. Not necessarily purposefully, but if you had a debt that you couldn't pay, then often it meant you, your wife, your children, you're all sold into slavery. I mean, that was just a, a, an ordinary concept. So, the, yeah, the early Christians understood, yeah, we had been sold into bondage to Satan. He had a bond against us because of what our parents did, and be honest, each one of us, you know, ends up personally disobeying God and, and all of that. And so he's got us. He is not going to let us go. But Jesus yeah, I'll let them go. Wow, if I can have you and do what I want with you, torture you, humiliate you, kill you, yeah, I will let humans free if I can do that. And so that's what, why Jesus died, and to ransom us from Satan's hold. You know, a lot of people will read about the ransom and they'll say, yeah, from the Father. Well, when on earth does a parent pay the the, the ransom, I mean, when is the ransom paid to the parent? I mean, you pay the ransom to the kidnapper, not, not to the parent. I mean, that, that makes no sense at all. But, just like in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, he got to do exactly what was agreed with Jesus, but he thought Jesus would have to stay in Hades forever. He never thought about the fact that Hades came into existence only because of sin, that a perfect person cannot be held into Hades. And if you, the creator of life, goes into the realm of the dead, wow, he's going to break open the, the gates of, of Hades. And so that is what happened. The, the scriptures say he preached to the dead. He took uh, people uh, on high, not to heaven, but, but to paradise. And by the way, he, he's always plugging my books. I hope you have all read Doug's book on <laughs> what's the truth about heaven and, and hell. I mean, it's the first book I have read that really lays out, and, and he lays out just what I was saying. Hey, here's one view, here's, here's another view, and, and all that. He lets you make the final decision, but he lays out views that most people have never even heard about, and which often are what the early Christians believed, or at least some of them. It was an alternative view, you know, among the early, early church. In fact, everything he says was, as, as far as I can remember. So, yeah, Satan thinks he has won when Jesus dies on the cross. He's a all in jubilation and what happens his whole kingdom collapses mm -hmm. Christ rises as the victor perfectly lawfully I mean he submitted exactly what Satan wanted but in Satan's greed he wanted more than he had the, the right to now that's how they all understood it and so when they read that passage in Colossians the the bond the, the, the handwritten document however your translation says it yeah this was what Satan had on us He's nailed to the cross, Satan gives it up in exchange for Christ, and then Christ triumphs in the next verse, leads them captive. As he said, you can't plunder uh, the strong man's house unless you first bind him. He goes into Hades, and yeah, Satan is bound, and he plunders uh, Satan's house in Hades, and anyway, that's, that's the Christus Victor understanding of the atonement. Doesn't make sense to you, fine, uh, but just only understand it made sense to them back yeah. there. Now Anselm in the 11th century, medieval thinking, he says, oh, that, that's dumb, and that doesn't make any sense <laughs> at all, you know, he's going to negotiate with Satan. No, what, what it was, was, and this is the age of chivalry and, you know, the, the Middle Ages, that God's honor had been impugned, mm -hmm. and uh, his honor had to be satisfied because he's been insulted by what man has done. A champion needs to come who's going to satisfy God's honor so that we can, you know, be released. That made sense to medieval minds, see? Mm -hmm. uh, it never dawned on Anselm that maybe 500 years more in the future, that wouldn't make sense to anybody <laughs> when the age of chivalry and all of that is over with. So the reformers, 
that came up with this idea, God can't forgive us, and uh, therefore, he had to punish somebody. And so, I mean, would that make any sense to anybody? I mean, one of your children is disobedient, so you go punish the other one, you know? It's like, I mean, and a lot of people have been turned away from God because of that teaching. Again, if, I mean, if really, if it doesn't present you any problems, then, yeah, I, I shouldn't ridicule that. I mean, that's not being fair. Because, yeah, if, if it all sounds good to you, then, yeah, no point rocking the boat. But, yeah, if it's caused you any issues, yeah, do realize that is just one theory. The problem is so many people think that is what Christians have always believed. I've gotten enormous flack in uh, quite a number of circles, not from ICOC, because of just sharing what the early Christians believed about the atonement. I and mean, people get really livid about it. And, in fact, you know, I have a CD set on it, and the only reason it's there is, is uh, uh, a man who had heard it before we ever offered it. It was just something I had taped for someone who was inquiring. He was inquiring about the atonement. David, this doesn't make sense to me. I mean, I'm just really struggling with this. I said, hey, let me send you some tapes that, this was back when they were cassettes, yeah, that explains what the early Christians believed, and see if this maybe makes sense to you. you know, he listened to it, he said, man, this, this has changed everything for me. Wow, I can really embrace God. David, you've got to put this out. I said, I can't. It is too hot. People get really, really upset, you know, when you start saying there's another view of the atonement. Yeah, but David, there's people who've been turned away from God because of that teaching. You mm. owe it, you know. All right, so I've, I went ahead and, and did it, and uh, the people who like it really like it, you know. People who don't really don't like it, you know. And, uh, but, yeah, think, think about that. Think about Jesus' illustration of the king. And I'm going to end on, on this note. I think he's a king in one and maybe the other one a, a master, whatever. The servant owes him this huge debt. All right, what happened? What does he do? Does he say, I'm sorry, I cannot forgive your debt. Uh, if someone else will pay it, then that's okay, but I can't forgive it. Is that what happens? No. No, it's not what happens. He freely forgives. But when then that servant wants to, it refuses to forgive his fellow man, then then God reinstates the debt. And Jesus says, your sins, if you forgive others, your sins are forgiven. I mean, it fits everything Jesus said. But see, under the uh, penal substitution theory, mm -hmm. yeah, God didn't forgive us. Jesus came and paid the Father uh, instead of our having to pay it. But that's not what Jesus said. He said, you know, in that illustration, it's forgiven. So anyway, these are just some, like I say, not the major points of Colossians, but things since you are a deeper audience and have read the book and you know the general contents, I thought I would just share with you some of these things you might take home and chew on a while. Thank you.